just before uh, we get started in the message this morning, I'm wondering if we could take a, just a moment to pray. It's a very far away place from us, but in Morocco, people are grieving and diligently searching, trying to find loved ones that they hope are still alive. Would you join me in prayer? Uh, Father, uh, in our world, these tragic events happen. And honestly, if it were even one person, it would be unbearable for those who know and love them. But over 2,000 people have lost their lives, and well over 1,000 still remain missing, and, and no one knows their fate right now. For those who are still alive, would you get rescuers to them? Would you give them an intuition to know where to look? And for those who have lost loved ones, would you be a source of comfort to them? Would you surround them with people who know you? Not so that we can give just flippant answers, but so that they can offer hope for their souls. We ask that you would do that in Jesus' name. Amen. I know some of you thought I was going to have a moment of prayer for the beginning of the NFL season <laughs> and the, the Buffalo Bills playing on Monday night against Aaron Rodgers and the New York Jets. Fasting and prayers are appreciated. <laughs> uh, we're in chapter 27, and the end of that, uh, next week we'll actually conclude our series in Matthew, and we've been over a year processing this gospel together. What's interesting is that um, for three weeks, we actually have not been exposed to any of the public teaching of Jesus at the end of chapter 25. Uh, he is not giving any more parables. He's not making any more teaching statements. All the lessons that we're learning from him now are by observing him in the incredible trials that he is going through and the test of his crucifixion. And so there is still much to learn from Jesus. And, and in a way, we're getting to eavesdrop on some of his private prayers and overhear some of the things that he is saying. It is behind the scenes that we are getting to observe what is going on. And what I want you to, to, to begin to recognize today is that the cross of Jesus inflicted a lot more than just physical pain. That's not to diminish physical pain. And if you are experiencing that this morning or you know people who've struggled with it, especially a long-term pain situation, it's unbelievably difficult to walk through those kinds of experiences. But they're not isolated from other things. There are spiritual things and there are emotional things that people also process in the middle of that. And so it starts out in verse 45 of Matthew chapter 27 saying, from noon until three in the afternoon, darkness came over all the land. If you remember in the beginning of Jesus' ministry, it said that the heavens were opened and God speaks and we see that he's being recognized as God's son and his ministry is being launched and now it seems like the heavens are closed and it seems like God has nothing to say. Go on in chapter, or, uh, chapter 27, verse 46. About three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And when some of those standing there heard this, they said, he's calling Elijah. That someone would scream out in pain during a crucifixion is not unusual. It's one of the most excruciating ways to end a human life ever devised by people. It was brutal torture. It was unthinkable. And there isn't anyone that I know who thinks it's an appropriate way of an execution. So Matthew is, is telling us what's happening in this moment, but Jesus yells something out. So what is he yelling out? And we're surprised that what he's yelling out is actually a prayer, a prayer. And it's so sacred to Matthew that he actually records it in the original language that Jesus is speaking. We're getting a verbatim response here. He's telling us, and it's in the, the language of Aramaic, which is the language that was spoken in that region of the world. And the, the, the translation of it is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It's, it's the last recorded sentence we have in Matthew's gospel before the death of Jesus. 
And what we're surprised is that it's a question. It's not a statement. And questions to us seem weaker than declarations or, or making arguments or proving something. But Jesus has spent his entire life redefining what strength is. Why have you abandoned me? Two key words, why me? Have you ever asked it? When you're facing unbelievable devastation, when you're walking through unbelievable relational, emotional, financial, or physical pain, have you ever asked that question, why me? We're surprised, aren't we, that Jesus is asking that question on the cross. And here's the thing. There are some people who really struggle believing that Jesus actually felt abandoned in that moment. It doesn't fit their, their understanding of spirituality, that somehow if you get spirituality correct, if you understand the right things in the right way, if you say the right things at the right time, that, that you won't have any moments like this. In fact, there are people who the primary reason they pursue religion at all is to try to avoid the things they don't like in life. And so if that's the reason for being a Christian, this passage is going to be very unsettling for you because what we see is Jesus asking the question that we would ask. And what's interesting is that he's actually quoting the first verse of Psalm 22, which if you remember from last week, we talked about Psalm 22 has a number of references to the crucifixion of Jesus. And there are some people who go, oh, see, that proves it. He's just, he's quoting a verse of scripture. That's not what's happening here. Jesus has so immersed his life in Scripture that even in the worst moments of it, it's a part of him. He finds his language for what he's going through in Scripture itself. And this is something for us to consider. You might not know this. Some people are very uncomfortable with honest prayers. I don't know how it was in your house, but uh, uh, I, I, my parents were old school. Anybody have any old school parents? Yeah, there were lines you didn't cross, and they were all over the house. <laughs> and uh, if I was misbehaving in church, my father would do this, because he was a pastor. And uh, you, you might think that I was safe somewhere out in the congregation, but he would just look at me and go. And that didn't mean stop. That, many how, that meant how many swats were coming my way. <laughs> I used to get weak in the knees when he praised God. I'd go, oh, geez, <laughs> what am I doing? That, that in those moments when, when life is excruciating difficult, you read through the Psalms, which is the prayer book of Scripture, and you see incredibly honest declarations being made and really heartbreaking questions being asked. And the worst thing about what Jesus is going through is not just the physical pain, not to diminish that. It's horrific. But there's been betrayal, and he feels abandoned. And if you want to know, that's how hell really breaks into our world. You feel those things, and it really doesn't matter what house you live in or how much money you have in your bank. But above all of this, he doesn't feel his father's presence, and this is for the first time in his entire physical life. The outward darkness that the world is experiencing in that moment tells us something dramatic is happening, but Jesus is feeling another kind of darkness, and that's the absence of his father. And we're uncomfortable with it because this statement makes Jesus look weak. In fact, it's one of the ways you know that it actually had to happen because if the scriptures were being edited to make people look better than they were, this is not what you would leave in there. You would take this out. He feels separated from God, and in a way, he feels like he's dying before he's dead. Why? Why isn't God with Jesus right now when he needs him most? Good question, because there are moments when we will sense the exact same thing. This is what complete despair sounds like. This is the language of complete despair. It's, it's, it goes way beyond any physical pain that he's experiencing. 
It was, it's worse than the betrayal and the abandonment of his friends and his disciples. But don't miss what's happening here. Even though Jesus cannot sense God's presence, he's still speaking to him. That's important. See, how questions, that's what YouTube is for. How do you make the refrigerator stop leaking? In our house this last week, it was buy a new refrigerator. <laughs> that's an expensive answer to that question. How questions, those are the realms of science. Why questions, those are the realms of God's spirit. And Jesus is asking, why, why have you abandoned me? So with the time that I have remaining, I'd like to have, uh, usually I just have kind of a main point and I drive it home. This is so packed with so much stuff that I just want to give you seven things that I've been reflecting on as I've gone through this passage. And I know you're terrified right now because uh, look what time it is. And he said, he's got seven things to say. And, uh, and, and you're probably crying out to God right now. Why me? Why, why me? Uh, the first reflection, if Jesus can ask hard questions and still believe in God, so can we. So can we. I mean, sometimes we find an answer, and that's very liberating. That's what deep conversation is about. That's what counseling is about. But sometimes there are no answers. And yet there's something liberating in hearing Jesus ask the question, isn't there? In the Old Testament, there was a guy named Job who my, uh, my computer refuses to accept as the proper name of a human being and thinks it's the word job. And uh, he was going through some horrific situations in his life and asking a lot of why questions. And his friends came along and they thought they had the answers to that. And please hear this. And they were wrong. When we're going through really difficult things, there are people who will come around us and, and they will have what they assume to be the answers to our why questions. Jesus doesn't sense his father, but he cries out to him anyway. This is not a loss of faith. This is faith at, at its deepest level. When I can't sense God, when I can't hear God, when nothing seems to be going the way that I want it to go, when I am surrounded by complete darkness, I can still call on him. Just because I don't sense him does not mean he is not present. Second reflection, Jesus took on our questions, our feelings, and our sense of abandonment and still believed in God. Your questions do not make an argument that you have no faith. We have to rid ourselves of that foolish thinking. Your questions are honest questions and you bring them before a holy God and you're not afraid to ask why because God's not embarrassed. It's not as though he doesn't have answers. We might know them, but God knows them. So many of the prayers are, are, are Jesus crying out to God, even in his death. This is interesting. Even in his death, people misunderstand Jesus. And, and the, the language uh, starts out, Eli, Eli, it's, it's my God, my God. And uh, people who are standing around misunderstanding, they think he's calling for Elijah, which is an interesting character from the Old Testament. He's the kind of guy that would absolutely have a following on YouTube. Like he would go viral in a heartbeat. This guy was a piece of work and uh, remarkable for a lot of reasons. I wish I could give you some of his history, but he was considered kind of the patron saint of lost causes, the, the way in the Catholic Church, St. Christopher is considered today. And there was this passage in Malachi, which is the last book of the Bible. It's one of the last promises given in the Old Testament, last book in the Old Testament, sorry. And it says, see, I will send the prophet Elijah to you before that great and dreadful day of the Lord comes. And so people assume that what he's doing is, he's, is Jesus is asking Elijah to come and rescue him from the cross. He'd been taunted by all the people around him. If you're really the son of God, come down from that cross, then we will believe you. If you can escape the cross, because, because religions as a rule don't like crosses. They don't like trials. They don't like tests. They assume that religion is the way you avoid all of that. And so their assumption, their, this is fascinating. Even in his death, they're misunderstanding Jesus. 
They assume he's trying to escape and trying to prove who he is. Verse 48 says, immediately one of them ran and got a sponge and he filled it with wine vinegar, put it on a staff and offered it to Jesus to drink. And the rest said, now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to save him. Someone heard Jesus crying out in his agony and they wanted to relieve the pain. So they soaked a sponge in some wine and they lifted it up on a staff so that he could try to get some uh, liquid out of that. And the people around, just think about this for a second. The people around see his anguish. The people around see someone trying to help and the people around say, hold it. Don't help him. Back off. Let's see what happens. Religion at its worst is more interested in a show than it is in helping people. And for them, maybe Elijah will come. That's worth seeing. Maybe he won't. That will prove they were right all along. What the sponge bear did not know is that he was actually offering something to the living Son of God. And Jesus had just said in Matthew 25, if you remember one of his last teachings, I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. And they said, when did we ever see you thirsty and give you something to drink? This person is responding to the need of Jesus. Verse 50 says, and when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. He cries out with a loud voice. Matthew doesn't record his words. We, we do learn from uh, John's gospel that, uh, that his words are, it is finished. The point is, is, it's not a declaration of his innocence. I didn't, he's not saying, I didn't do anything wrong. It's not a declaration of a vengeance. I'll come back and I'll, I'll end all of you. My work is done. My life has ended and he gives up his spirit and Jesus is dead. There's no pretending here. Jesus is dead. At that moment, the curtains of the temple were torn in two from top to bottom. At that moment, the curtain the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook, the rocks split, tombs broke open. The bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. They came out of the tombs after Jesus' resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared to many. Here's my third reflection. God was not ignoring Jesus. He was waiting. God was not ignoring Jesus. He was waiting. When you feel like you're being ignored by God, just assume that God is not done. God still has something to do. He still has something to say. He's patient. He's waiting. We might not know what or for why, but he's waiting. He's waiting. God's response to the death of Jesus was inside of the, the worship space. It was this huge veil, huge curtain. And it separated anyone that would come into the worship space from a place called the Holy of Holies. There was only one person who was allowed to go into the Holy of Holies, and he was only allowed to go in one day a year. And he was to offer blood sacrifice for the sins of the entire nation. And if you went into the presence of God and you were considered sinful, you wouldn't be able to stand in the presence of God. It's not like it was the, the anger of God uh, uh, trying to, to slap someone down. It's more like when unholy walks into the presence of holy, it's, you, you just don't survive that really well. And so when the high priest went in, he would go in with a lot of fear and trepidation. Like this was not a, it's not like I walked up here on Sunday, uh, this Sunday morning. And he would go in and, and what they would do is they had a system because if, if he died there, no one could go rescue him. Because anybody who went in there would also be sinful and, and they would die. And this creates a situation you can't solve. So what they would do is they put a rope on the high priest's foot. And he would go into the Holy of Holies dragging that rope. And then they wouldn't know if he was still alive or dead. 
And so they put bells on the bottom of his robe. And the high priest would go in to pray, and he would bounce while he prayed. In fact, if you, are to, if you were to go to the Wailing Wall in Jerusalem today, where rabbis and, and, and Jewish people go to pray, you will see them take small prayers written on paper and stick them into the cracks of the wall, and they'll stand there. And to this day, this is often a posture of prayer in the Jewish faith. And what was he doing? He was keeping the bells ringing. And if the bells stopped, they just pulled the rope. You came in here today with so much confidence. <laughs> you never thought for one moment that your life was at risk. Your weight, maybe, with the calories and the donuts, but not your life. What's the first thing God does? The instant Jesus gives up his spirit is he tears that veil from top to bottom and he says, I am done with only one and only one day a year of people having access to me from this moment forward because of the death of my son. Anyone, anytime, full, complete access. Is that good news? Is that good news? This is unbelievably good news. Unbelievably good news. He tears the veil. Fourth reflection. Every single person carries a veil within their mind. We call it our conscience. It tells us we are not holy enough to approach God. God tore the veil, that curtain in the temple, but for many of us, we still have one. So, well, my, my conscience tells me what I've done in the past, especially when you're going through hard things, right? What have I done to deserve this? There's the question, and you're looking for the reason. I've sat beside the bed of people who are octocanarians in their 80s who believe that the reason they're sick and suffering right now is something that they did when they were a teenager. They believe that punishment finally found them after all these years. So the bad news is when your conscience tells you you are a sinner, believe it, you are. The good news is, is God's work is greater than your conscience. And when Jesus tells you you are his brother and sister in Christ, believe him because you are. You are. You can believe Jesus more than your conscience. The torn veil tells us what what, the, the, this is the next reflection. The torn veil tells us what God thinks of the death of Jesus. He, he, he tears that veil, but something else happens. The earth shakes. The, something so powerfully spiritually is happening that it has a seismic effect in the earth around. And uh, the sky was dark before Jesus dies, but now the earth shakes shakes after Jesus dies. Because this was a death like no other. But what's really fascinating, I mean, I, I watched, I just glanced at the news this morning on my way in and, and, and saw the incredible devastation, buildings that have stood for hundreds and hundreds of years in a place that earthquakes have not been known and, and just demolished. And in this shaking, there's, there's no reference of anything being destroyed in Scripture. The only thing that seems to happen is that tombs broke open. What is God telling us? Not only have I canceled sin through the death of my son, but I've canceled death through the death of my son too. That's amazing. And, and there are some people who have a hard time believing this next thing, the bodies of, of some of these people who had died, looking forward to faith in God. They were, they were raised and, and, and they walked into Jerusalem. And, and this is where some people, especially in the modern world, they say, you just can't believe stuff like that. Right, we should only believe what you think is credible. Let's make that the limitation of what God is able to do. There's no sense in believing in God if he can't do any more than you can do on a good day. God can do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we ever ask or can even imagine. 
That's the God that we serve. And by the way, the idea of, of resurrection of a body, that's, that's not just humorous to people today who think that's anti-intellectual. It was considered foolishness by the Greeks because in their worldview, the material body was just, Im it was immaterial. It, was, it, it served no purpose. It, it was something that you wanted to discard, that, that it is the laying aside of the body that was the freedom of your true self. And, but hear this, it was Jesus who, it was God who created the human body. It was God who took on human form and, it's, and it was God who raised the physical body of Jesus from the dead. Our bodies matter to God. In Matthew chapter 27, beginning in verse 54, it says, and when the centurion and those with him were guarding Jesus, saw the earthquake and all that had happened, they were terrified and exclaimed, surely he was the son of God. Many women were there watching from a distance. They had followed Jesus from Galilee to care for his needs. And among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Joseph, and, and the mother of Zebedee's sons. What people had said in mockery is now repeated in faith. I want the worship team to come up. A soldier says, surely, surely this was the Son of God. Even before a resurrection, there was something so remarkably different about the death of Jesus. He understood. That's my sixth reflection, is that conversions can happen in the least likely places and the least likely people. We think we know who's ready and who's not. We think we know who's interested and who isn't. We think that conversions only take place in rooms like this, not in the places you work or the neighborhoods you live in, or the cars that you're driving. But the Spirit of God is everywhere and all the time. And he's torn the veil so that anyone in any moment can cross over the threshold and into his presence. Last reflection. God can accept our imperfect faith because he accepted a perfect sacrifice. I don't know if you noticed it, but in the scripture, it said, surely he was the son of God. It's past tense. And of course, any good theologian would know he is the son of God. And here's what I want you to hear. If you're waiting for your, perfect, your faith to be perfect so that God accepts you, your faith will never be enough. We are not saved because our faith is perfect. We are saved because the one we're putting our faith in is perfect. So your, your struggles, your doubts, your questions, your, your private musings, the, the inner arguments that you have, that you think have separated you from God, that you think has made you less than valid follower of Jesus, that you think maybe proves to yourself that you're not really a follower of God, or maybe that he doesn't even exist. I have very, very good news for you today. The smallest faith, the weakest faith, the slightest of size directed towards heaven is enough. When Jesus says, it is finished, he meant his work was done and you are welcome in. So would you bow your heads right now? Because the question I have for you, the question I have for you, have you started approaching God? because he's torn the veil down. Every barrier, he's removed it. Have you secretly suspected that your doubts and your fears have proven beyond any reasonable expectation that your faith is not valid? Our faith may rise and fall. Our confidence may ebb and flow. Our language 
may it sometimes be ins inspirational and at other times embarrassing. All of those things can be true. We are human. All of those things can be true. But our faith is in one who is perfect, not in ourselves or our own faith. So if you're here this morning and you, you haven't crossed that threshold, you haven't said, okay, I'm going to trust what Jesus did for me. He's able to cancel sin. He's able to cancel death. I'm going to trust him. If you've not done that, I'm going to ask that you do that today. And I'm going to ask that you do that just by looking up at me right now. So if, if, you're, if you're not responding, just bow your head. But if you're looking up, I'm, I'm going, and I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to do anything to, to try to make you feel awkward in any way. Somebody says, well, looking up isn't much of a response. Um, I wish I had time to tell you how that's exactly the response that Jesus used more than once. So if you're, if you're crossing that line today, I'm going to start over here by the, the windows on my right, it'd be on your left, and I'm just going to look. And if you're, you're making that decision today, I just want to see your eyes, look right at me, and let me acknowledge you, all right? So I'm going through, going through. Right there, I see that person. Thank you. Just keep looking. I see that person. Thank you. I see that person. I see that person. I see that person. Thank you. I'm in the next section over. Just look right at me. Thank you. I see that person. I see that person. Thank you. Just keep looking until I acknowledge you. All right. I'm in the center section. Just look right at me if you're making that decision today. You're going to take imperfect faith and put them in a perfect Christ. Just say, thank you, I see that person. I'm in the next section, over. Just look right at me if you're making that decision today. All right. I see that person, thank you. Next person, next, last section over by the windows. If you're making that decision today, just, just look right up at me. I see that person, thank you. Anyone else? I see that person, thank you. Let's all stand together today. Would you repeat this simple prayer, everyone together, after me? Jesus, save me. <laughs> and that's it. Those words activate the goodness and grace of God into all of our lives. Father, thank you for those who've crossed the line of faith today. Cement in them the deep and abiding truth. You will never forsake them. You will never leave them. In Jesus' name, amen.